Okay, so this video is just going to be going over the IRB, the Institutional Review Board document that we need to get, to do if you're wanting to actually do a uh, some research on human subjects. Every institution is going to have some of these, uh, have certain documents where you need to fill out, and it's basically just enough to cover the university's rear end just in case something happens. I mean, it's maybe not going to cover everything, but there's going to be some procedures that you need to say, Hey, this is what, um, uh, this is what we're going to be doing. And that's it. And, uh, these are the safeguards and you need to follow those. If there's any major changes to them or certain changes to those that, you, uh, if it gets approved and you want to make some changes afterward, then you need to go back to the board and say, Hey, I got something I need to change and they're going to go through the process again. Usually not as big a deal depending upon what the change is, but we're going to go over some of the questions you need to answer in the document. Now here's the thing. This document is actually fairly, very, very simple compared to other institutions that I've been at and have seen some of them. Some of them is, man, it's, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a juggernaut to actually fill some of this out sometimes. But this one here at Wilmington is actually pretty simple. Um, and really, I think every institution can probably do this and it would be perfectly fine. Uh, but we're going to go through it and go through some of the, um, some of the questions and some things that you need to have there. So and we'll just, uh, we'll just go on to it. So here is the document. All right. So here's the IRB document. It's the application for use of human subjects in research. And this document needs to be filled out before you can do anything with these subjects, even recruitment. You need to actually do this document and get the study approved before you can even do any, any recruitment. That's why I like to do it first is that if you want to do a study, uh, in this, uh, in this semester, then you probably ought to get moving forward with this pretty quickly and get it going. Cause sometimes it can take a couple of weeks for them to be able to re to review it and get it approved and all that stuff. Sometimes though, if we're doing like a survey research, usually we can do an ex expedited, uh, form and we're going to be able to, uh, get it approved pretty quickly actually. So, but anyway, let's look at what we need to answer. So first off question number one here. So provide a brief description of the proposed study the purpose and the problem to be investigated. This, these questions don't need to be, you don't need to write an entire book or multi-page paper about each of these questions, but this one is the one you really need to focus in on is give a, um, and there's other ones you need to focus in on too, but this one's pretty important because you need to give a reason why you're doing this, give a sound reason why you're doing it. And part of this is going to be some of the preliminary literature review that you've done beforehand you need to be able to put in the here and say, here's the problem we have. This is what other people have done. And this is what we want to investigate moving forward. And that's really it. So usually a few paragraphs, um, sometimes one paragraph can do it, but usually a few paragraphs are going to be able to summarize everything uh, that you want to do within this. So be as, as detailed as possible, but be as concise as possible throughout all these questions, actually. Question number two, what are the qualifications for conducting the study? So what is your experience uh, in the procedures and instrumentation to be used in this study? Now, obviously you're going to be a student, but if you have any experience in any of these pieces of equipment or researching any of this, you can put that. But the second part of this question states that if you are a student, what is your status? And then which faculty member will supervise you throughout this research and what are their qualifications? So if you're uh, doing it and I'm going to be your uh, kind of your research assistant, you're going to be the PI or the principal investigator, but I'm going to be uh, your faculty member uh, that is going to be watching over you, making sure that everything is going to be uh, going smoothly. And I'm there to help you be a mentor, you know, whatever it may be, uh, give you some advice. But it could be another another faculty member. It doesn't have to be me. But uh, being for the class, usually it is me. But again, it doesn't have to be me. We can work with another faculty member if they are willing to do so. But put the qualifications in there. What experience do they have? Uh, I can give you some of the experiences that I have, background, whatever type of study that you might want to do. And then if you have any 
any type of experiences as well, working with those particular subjects, then you can go ahead and put that down as well. All right. Question number three, what are the requirements for and characteristics of the subject population? So what's their gender, their age, their um, age range, their health, medical status, are they prisoners, institutionalized, adults, mentally handicapped, et cetera. That et cetera can include a wide variety of parameters. You need to include what the population is, the specific population. You can't just say, uh, we're going to get athletes. Okay. Describe those athletes to me. You need to say, are they male athletes? Are they female athletes? Are they both? We're just going to do male and female athletes. All right. Let's say you're going to do a study with male athletes. What athletes are those athletes at Wilmington? Are they basketball players? Are they football players? Are they wrestlers? What team are they on? So you need to be able to describe what are they? So are they male, female? What sport do they play? What the age range is usually an age range. It doesn't have to be very specific. You know, it's going to be 18 years, two months to 22 years, five months. You know, it doesn't have to be specific like that. But you can say college age, or you can say between 18 and 30 or 20 to 30 year olds or whatever it might be. So you can say the age range. And then you want to say, what is their health medical status? You know, are they apparently healthy? Do they need to get physicals? And there's some certain parameters that we need to follow. If we're back to exercise testing and prescription, um, there are going to be some procedures that we need to go through if somebody needs to get clearance for any type of exercise. But you need to include all of this. Um, and also with this, it's a good idea to state why you're excluding a certain population. So if you want to do male athletes, why are you excluding female athletes from this? And it could just be based upon the description of your proposed problem. It's based upon male athletes, not based upon female athletes. And it could even be just based upon physiology as well. A lot of times in environmental physiology, as researchers, we tend to exclude females because it does become a little bit more difficult to get accurate data during, uh, especially with, um, with body temperature throughout the different stages of the menstrual cycle. So that stuff has to be included in there. Why are you excluding certain populations and why are you focusing in on this specific population, but include everything about your subjects that you need to. And yes, that can include, uh, what their race is. Because sometimes you want to include African-Americans and not whites or vice versa, or you might want to include Hispanics and might want to include all of them. And maybe you're looking at the differences between African-Americans, uh, Hispanics, uh, whites, non-whites, whatever it might be. You need to include all of those data points in there or all of those characteristics in there. Now, question number four, how will the subjects be sampled, recruited, or otherwise enlisted as participants in the study. So how are you actually going to get to them? Are you going to send out an email, a mass email? Are you going to get in contact with coaches? Are you an athlete on one of the teams? And again, I'm making this example of the athletes just because it's kind of simplistic. But how are you going to get to your subjects? If you're going to study someone in a physical therapy clinic, how are you going to get in contact with those patients? And what procedures, what procedures do you need to go through? Who do you need to contact within that clinic to get in contact with those patients? So how are they going to be recruited? You need to have a script, an email script, maybe a telephone script, however it might be. If you want to hand out flyers, you need to have the flyers already uh, created while you're handing this in to the IRB or the Institutional Review Board. So just make sure everything is detailed about how you're going to recruit these subjects. Question number five, describe in detail the methodology of your study. So how will the study be conducted from start to finish as far as the human subjects are concerned? Also be specific about the methods, instrumentation, and the types of data being collected. This is another one that needs to be as detailed as possible. Again, it doesn't need to be an entire book. You don't need to give, you know, entire dissertation or research paper just on this certain question, but it needs to be pretty detailed. Because the IRB needs to know what are the instrumentations that are being used. 
Is there any safety concerns? Uh, how many times are the subjects actually going to be in the lab? How many times are you going to test them or test the different parameters? How many times you can take heart rate? How many times are you going to take blood pressure? If you're taking any type of blood data, that certainly needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, you need to be specific about that because that's, it's minimally invasive, but it is invasive. Um, so you're taking tissue samples. So if you do a finger stick, a finger prick, or if you actually do a blood draw, all of that is actually sticking somebody with a needle. So that needs to be taken into account. Uh, so you need to be specific about those types of things, uh, specific about, um, uh, when this is going to happen, how long the actual study is going to be, not just how long the trials are going to be, but how long the study is going to be. You're going to do one trial today and then one trial a year from now. You're going to do one trial today and one trial next week. And then that's it. Is there going to be a familiarization trial? Meaning that are they going to come in and get familiarized with the instrumentation that they're going to be using or that you're going to be using on them? You're going to show them the procedures and then you're going to go through the IRB with them or at least go through the, um, the consent form. So how many times are they actually going to meet with you? And again, what are some of the safety procedures uh, for that? And there's another question specified with those safety procedures as well. That we'll get into here in a little bit, but be specific about the methods, the instrumentation and the data that's being collected. Don't leave anything out. If height, weight, age, race, gender, all that stuff is going to be collected. Put it in there. If you can do heart rate, blood, blood pressure, uh, RPE, whatever the parameter is, Put it all in there. If you think you might include something, put it in there. Because if you don't, say you were going to do um, uh, a study where you, you were going to plan on taking blood pressure, but then you figured out, well, it's maybe not that easy to do blood pressure and it's really not that important and you decide not to, then you don't have to do it. It's in the IRB, but you didn't put it in there you, uh, because it wasn't part of the safety procedures. It was just simply part of your methodology. It wasn't necessarily an important part of the safety procedures. You don't have to do it. You can leave it out, but if you don't put it in there and then you decide, Hey, I want to do blood pressure. Now you have to go back and do an edit uh, and, and revise it and go back to the institutional review board and say, Hey, I want to add this in here. And here's the reason why. So it's just much easier to include it in the beginning and not use it if you don't want to, or don't need to. All right. Going down to question number six, describe the personnel, the materials, the equipment and other resources or other resource requirements for the study. So any of the personnel that are involved in the study, their role, any qualifications and their access to the data. So this is where you would list me, you or another a uh, researcher, another, uh, possibly another student. If you want to collaborate on a project, could be another professor, uh, could be somebody, um, uh, that is in charge of a clinic, whoever it might be, um, what their, um, what all the other resource requirements are of the study. So any of the other equipment or anything like that, that is needed, um, that is going to be available for you. And any of the qualifications that those people that you list, what are their qualifications in using that equipment? And also who sees the data? Some of this data is going to be personal in that there's going to be names attached to it. At some point, there's going to be the initial form where there's going to be a name attached to it. Now, eventually you will label them with a uh, kind of a, a non-identifiable marker. So S1 or subject one, subject two, subject three, you know, however you would, would like to number them once you put it into a data, ta data table. But at some point there's going to be a name attached to it and you can always go back and figure out who was subject four and who was subject 10, whatever it might be, but who has access to that? Who has access to the data as it's coming in live while the subjects are there? So those are important things to, to list. Question number seven. How will you obtain informed consent of the subject? So how, where, when will the study be explained to the subjects and how will the subjects indicate their consent? So this could be during a preliminary meeting with you 
they with you or with me and you. And it could even be if it's a survey, it could just be online. Really, they're just uh, clicking a consent form online. Yes, no, I agree or don't agree, whatever it might be. And um, but you need to detail about how that's going to happen. How are you going to explain to them what the procedures are, what the study is actually going to consist of and when they need to show up and how long it's going to be. Maybe if there's any compensation that we're going to give them, whatever that might be. Number eight is a big one. What are the potential risks for the subjects and what's the likelihood and seriousness of these risks? So that could be physical, psychological, social, legal, et cetera. It may result from your experimental procedures, the methods obtaining, handling, or reporting data. So there needs to be some, some way to explain, hey, people are going to be going through physical exercise, physical activity. There's going to be certain things that could potentially happen. I actually have a script for this. If you're just doing a basic exercise, there is a paragraph that I have that I can give you. If you're going to be doing a study, uh, we don't want to try to reinvent the wheel because at any type of physical activity, there could be risks for cramping, nausea, vomiting, lightheadedness, uh, passing out, you know, all this, all, uh, all these things that could happen during physical activity. The likelihood of them is fairly low for the most part, depending upon the subjects. But we certainly need to outline any of the risks that could happen. And we need to, this is an important part. This is where the safety aspect comes into, into play. And this is really the whole reason for the IRB is to make sure that we are keeping up with standards so that we are making sure the safety of the participants is the key factor is, is paramount to anything. If the safety is not there, or if at any point in time you're starting to see safety become secondary, that's when to either stop a procedure, stop a trial, or end the study, uh, even if it's your study. So you need to take a step back and make sure that the subject safety is key. That's and obviously there's going to be some uh, some instances that um, again just inherently might seem unsafe if someone's starting to get lightheaded um, while they're exercising. That could happen. Could obviously happen. Could be nutritional related, could be uh, medicinal related, whatever it might be. That's a potential. Any type of physical activity, especially if it's strenuous physical activity, high intensity. And you need to recognize that and be able to say, okay, we need to stop this or uh, get a feel for if the subject is about ready to pass out or if they can continue. But that's where having, um, having access to the athletic training clinic or some type of medical personnel or, um, having CPR certification is going to be helpful in that. And then question number nine, as ap applicable for each risk identified in number eight, was there any other methods that were considered to reduce or eliminate these risks and explain why they will not be used? Sometimes, uh, not always, but sometimes the simple answer and the truthful answer is no, nothing else has been considered because this is the procedure that needs to happen. And that's it. If you want to do a maximal exercise test, a VO2 test where you're measuring the gases, that's what you have to do. And there's going to be certain risks that are going to be with that. If you want to do a Wingate test, you have to do a Wingate test and there's going to be certain risks involved with that. So that's it. There, there was nothing else that was, that can substitute for this. Now there's going to be some times where you could say, well, other methods could be substituted. However, they would not answer the question or not face faithfully lead us toward a good data analysis or get a good amount of data that to answer the question that we had in the problem that we have that was outlined in question number one. That would be, I guess, somewhat of a political answer, but most of the time, this is what you want to do, and there's going to be risks involved. Yes, we want to try to eliminate all the risks we possibly can, but we also realize that there's going to be risks involved. On to question number 10, what are the potential benefits to the individual subjects and our society as a whole as a result of the proposed research? 
So this is where you can get into, well, we can learn more about whatever the parameter is that you're trying to measure Learn more about heart rate response during a certain exercise, or maybe some type of training methodology, whatever it might be, or maybe some type, uh, some type of psychological parameter that you're trying to look for in athletes. Uh, so that's individual, or that could be as a society and as a, uh, a body of literature as a whole, it could add to that and add to society and society's knowledge on that. And from the individual side, a lot of times the subjects, the subjects can learn how they are compared to their peers in those parameters. And they can also, especially if you're doing some type of testing, uh, maximal testing, you can say, Hey, these people are going to be able to uh, learn what their VO2 max is or what their maximal strength is in this specific area, whatever it might be. Number 11, as applicable, describe how you will minimize or protect against potential risks to subjects throughout the study. So this is where you would say, we're, you know, we're going to be in fairly close proximity to the athletic training facility. And we're also going to uh, have CPR and first aid certifications of the people that are involved. Uh, so, you know, we just need to make sure that there's going to be um, some safeguards that are in place for this. And we're going to go through health, health history questionnaires, uh, making sure that the subjects are um, relatively healthy. Uh, most of the time, the subjects are going to be college age or relatively young, younger, uh, younger than middle age, 40, 50 ish. So they're going to be apparently healthy, generally speaking. Uh, but we will, we will have access to those facilities that are going to be necessary if somebody does get injured, hurt, passes out. And we're also going to be able to have immediate care as well. And we're going to have a SOP or standard operating procedure dedicated. If somebody does happen to go down, pass out, uh, hit their head, whatever it might be to where we're, uh, you know, we have immediate care. Somebody calls 911, uh, somebody gets a hold of, um, other, um, you know, either athletic training or whatever it might be so that we can get that person taken care of as applicable. Number 12, provide the names and addresses of experts in your field, not including the investigators with whom the committee members could communicate to discuss the potential risks of your procedures. Um, these could be anyone that is a major uh, researcher that you might possibly know. Again, it can't necessarily be me. Uh, it could be somebody even within another uh, clinic. If you're looking at um, uh, doing research, maybe even survey stuff on people in other clinics, uh, could even be another professor as well, if you're doing something in psychology or some, uh, some sort of psychological test or questionnaire, then you might want to look at somebody over in psychology, but we can get in touch with some people. If, uh, maybe get a list of at least a couple people that, uh, you can list. And then number 13, if appropriate, provide references to any published materials that would help the committee make a judgment regarding your procedures for safeguarding the rights and safety of your subjects. So the big thing here is the safety of the subjects um, and that really trying to uh, reiterate the point that yes, there are risks involved, but these are the things that we are going through based upon this data. And you'll link that data. You'll link uh, a study or two saying that, yeah, we're doing a full, say for example, we're doing a full max test or measuring the gases or we're doing a wing gate test or whatever it might be. Yeah, there are risks involved, but these are the safeguards that we're going to put in place, the same safeguards that these studies have done uh, and these have worked out well. And then based upon maybe ACSM recommendations, we're not going to go through the whole process of, you know, having a physical done on the individual or having, having them uh, have to have a doctor sign off on it, whatever it might be based upon this data that we have. Here's the link. And there you go. So again, the big thing here is safety. Outline everything that you're going to do as detailed as possible, be as concise as possible, but as detailed as possible. Now, the, the, the thing is when you go through and do this, try to make it as neatly outlined as possible in that. So I'll give you an example. Go ahead and highlight, you know, question number one. Um, 
once you're done with it, say you have whatever the procedures is or the proposed study, the problem and, and to be investigated. And then you can go ahead and bold this. So go to font. I, I'm, I'm trying to do it without, <laughs> oh my goodness, the spinning wheel. Oh my goodness. It doesn't like me. I'm doing a whole bunch of different tasks kind of all at once. So there we go. Bold. We'll go ahead and bold that. There you go. So just go ahead and bold it. I would bold the questions and then have your answers as just normal font, or you can do vice versa, have the questions and then bold your answers, make it obvious to the IRB. What is the question and what is your answer? That's going to be important. Uh, for them. So the other thing too, is up here at the top, it's probably a good idea to put your name. Um, so let's just say up here at the top, I'm going to do, um, uh, V O two study. And that could be specific about the study and the study title. All right. So you might even want to put whoop, title V O two study. And then you could do P I Matt bliss, uh, whoever, or whoever you are. Uh, and then you even have a co PI, which is usually me, or it could even be another student as well. So if you want to collaborate, do, do things like that, but make sure to put who it is. That's always a good, good thing to, to do when you're handing this in. Sometimes I'll clean this up. You'll send this to me. I'll look over it a couple different times. We'll go back and forth with this. And then I'll usually clean this up and take that out. Um, and then there we go. So, and then clean it up to make sure that everything looks nice and neat for the uh, committee members. Now, the good thing is, uh, I don't know if it starts. <laughs> I'm not sure when it starts, but I am actually on this committee. Uh, at least starting in the fall. I'm not sure if it starts in the spring or in the summer too. So I have a little bit of clout. So, uh, but I can get this, get this moving, uh, at least fairly quickly. Now there's going to be, uh, I shouldn't be the only person looking at it. There should be somebody else also looking at it as, as well, because there's a little bit of a bias. Um, so I have some conflict of interest that is going on with this. I want you to move forward with it as quickly as possible. I'm on the committee, but I know what, the committees are probably going to be looking for or the committee members are going to be looking for. I know what I would look for, uh, but we need to move uh, forward with it to try to get somebody else to also look at it briefly, just to make sure that I'm not overlooking something because of my bias. I'll just be honest in that. And I have a little bit of bias and I want to get, <laughs> get you moving as quickly as possible. Now, the one thing that I didn't include with this and we can go over it uh, and I'll actually put it up on blackboard is that, there are a couple other different forms. There's going to be, uh, uh, forms that an expedited form to where we can move forward quickly with this to where we don't have to go through the full board review because you're not actually taking blood samples or tissue samples, things like that, or any like really personal information. Uh, we can get that sent through through an expedited, uh, form. It's real simple. Uh, there's also an exemption form. Usually that's reserved for things that just, uh, you know, surveys basically is what you're going to be doing. So we can actually do that form as well, but those are going to be up on Blackboard also. So we can, um, go over those if you need to, but I wanted to go over this IRB because if you want to do a study, you can get moving with this. You can start to work on it a little bit here over the next few weeks. I would probably get it in uh, probably sometime. Uh, I would say the end of June. Now there could be a scenario. This is where I want to get into this. If you really wanted to do a study and you know that there's, there might not be enough time to do it during the summer. Uh, and, and some of the things might not be available because we're getting equipment in and, uh, we might not be fully functional until the fall semester to where if, if you wanted to, uh, we could go through this and I could still give you a grade on this and, and basically end the class and you're proposing this, but knowing that you're probably not going to start the study until the fall semester, I will give you some options to continue working on this in the fall, 
But at the same time for this class, you'll go through this, get it approved, and then we'll do something else, a longer, uh, basically a longer, uh, version of what would normally happen in this with the write-up with the intro, the, uh, basically the chapters, chapter one, two, and three, the, the, uh, intro, the, the literature review and the methodology, maybe do a little bit longer with that. So getting closer to that, um, 15 that I'm requiring for the literature review, but not quite the 15 because you are doing a little bit extra work with the, uh, with the IRB in the RB application. So you are doing more work, but if you really want to do a study, I can give you that option to where we can continue this during the fall, actually do the study during the fall. If you want to make sure you have time to do it and you're really interested in, in the topic. Now, if it's a survey, you should be able to get it done within the time frame. but I'd still make sure to get it in within uh, the next couple of weeks, ne- next few weeks. So get it in by the end of June. That way you have about a month to get it done. No, not to say that we can't get a study done in a month. We can certainly get something done with it within a month, even if it's something to do with, um, you know, exercise. But it can be a little bit harder, especially during the summer. Uh, people are out. A lot of students aren't on campus. Uh, some of the athletes are maybe here for camps. Uh, they, they could be around, uh, whatever it might be. But if you want to continue it during the fall, I can give you that option and we can work something out where we're getting closer to that 15 literature review, 15 page literature review, but it's not quite uh, that full length. So I'm thinking 10 or 12 pages because it's probably, um, you know, it's going to be warranted uh, to make sure you have everything in place for the fall. And then we can continue on and possibly if it's, if it's good enough, we can maybe try to get a poster made, things like that. So, but the first thing get this going. If you're really interested in a topic, if you want to talk to me about a topic, uh, please hit me up and we can discuss it. We can start getting these things going, um, forward. So anyway, if you have any questions about, uh, the IRB application, just let me know. So if, if there's nothing else, I thank you and I bid you adieu. So take care.